The Sainted Queens by Unknown, St. Elizabeth of Hungary, Chapter 1. There are few names in the calendar of the saints so full of tender and poetical associations as hers who has come down to us through six long centuries as the dear St. Elizabeth. Her history has the brilliancy of a romance of chivalry with the deep pathos of a tale of human affection added to the more sacred interest which belongs to the biography of a saint. In her short life of four and twenty years, she passed through all the trials of wife, mother, and widow. She had her brief taste of more than common happiness, and then a bitter draught of sorrow, such as is given to none but those highly favored souls who drink of the Lord's own chalice and are baptized in his own baptism of blood. Her image stands out before us on the pages of a chivalrous biographer, like one of the beautiful frescoes often discovered under the whitewash of an old Gothic church. A spirit, yet a woman too, with the expression of a bright and playful child on the features of some youthful martyr smiling at the rack. Her tortures were of the soul and the spirit. The slow wringing of all earthly affections out of a heart which cherished them only next to God, the early death of her princely husband, the ingratitude of her poor, the persecution of her kindred, the separation from her early friends and her beloved children, the mysterious harshness of her director, and the utter loneliness and isolation of her last few years of a life which had been so full of love, made that short life as full of sorrow as its days were few. And yet the prevailing feature in the character of this lovely saint is an infantine joyousness in the midst of anguish and bereavement, well befitting the cherished daughter of St. Francis. She sheds a gleam over the stern times in which she lived like a little golden flower, which bears her name, and looks brightly up to heaven from its home on the wild heath or mountainside, fit emblem of the dear Saint Elizabeth, or like the star which presided over her birth and which her father's minstrel astrologer announced to the nobles of Thuringia. The Maitre Klingsor had come all the way from Hungary to settle a dispute among the noble minstrels of the Landgrave's court. They asked him to tell them something new, and he replied, I will tell you something new and joyful withal. I see a fair star which ariseth in Hungary, and shineth from thence to Marburg, and from Marburg over the whole earth. Know that this very night there is born to my lord, the king of Hungary, a daughter who shall be called Elizabeth. She shall be given in marriage to the son of the prince of this land. She shall be a saint, and her sanctity shall be a joy and consolation of Christendom. In accordance with this prediction on the day and the hour named by Klingsor and Eisenach, the queen of Hungary gave birth to a daughter who was baptized by the name of Elizabeth. Andrew II, King of Hungary, the father of Elizabeth, was noted alike for his successful wars against the pagans, his earnest piety, and his generosity towards the church and the poor. Some of the vast gold mines, which at this day form the wealth of Hungary, were discovered in his region, and their produce enabled him to multiply his alms in building churches, endowing convents, and increasing his already abundant liberality to the poor. His Queen Gertrude, the descendant of Charlemagne and sister of St. Hedwig, equaled him in piety and goodness. The most tender affection united these two holy souls, and they watched with joy the early promise of sanctity which marked the infancy of their lovely child. The first words which passed her lips were the names of Jesus and Mary, and even at the age of three years, the germ of that tender compassion for the poor, for which she was hereafter to be distinguished, shewed itself in looks of piety for their distress, which she strove to alleviate by gifts. Thus was her first deed in alms, her first word a prayer. The Hungarians were already rejoicing in this blessed child when a noble embassy arrived from Hermann Landgrave of Hesse and Thuringia and Count Palatine of Saxony to ask her hand in marriage for his son Louis. The request was granted for the Landgrave's fame as a noble Christian knight and sovereign had reached the ears of the king and queen of Hungary, and they feared not to entrust their precious child to his keeping. So the little princess, now four years old, was laid in a massive silver cradle, and as the king gave her into the hands of the lord of Varilla, the Landgrave's ambassador, he said, I entrust my chief earthly comfort to your knightly honor, to which the good knight replied, I receive her right willingly into my keeping, and will ever be faithful to her. He kept his word, as we shall see. The long journey into Thuringia was safely made. The landgrave pressed his little daughter to his heart, and thanked God for having given her to him. She was solemnly betrothed to the young Duke Louis, who was now eleven years old, and from that day forward the two children were brought up together, and called each other the sweet names of brother and sister, a touching practice which in their wedded life they never laid aside. The early piety of little Elizabeth seems to have been deepened by a sorrow which befell her soon after her arrival in Thuringia. Her mother, whom she tenderly loved, was cruelly murdered by traitors who aimed at the life of the king. The landgrave chose out seven of the noblest maidens of his court of about her own age to be brought up with the princess of Hungary. One of these ladies, named Gouda, remained with her nearly to the end of her life and was one of the principal witnesses of the process of her canonization. From her deposition are derived the following details of St. Elizabeth's childhood. She would go, says her loving companion, to the castle chapel as often as she could, and place herself at the altar step with a great psalter open before her, though she did not yet know how to read, and then she would fold her little hands together, and raising her eyes to heaven, become absorbed in prayer. 
When at play with her companion, she would hop on one foot towards the chapel, whither the others were obliged to follow her, and if she found it closed, she would kiss the lock, the door, and the very walls for love of the hidden god who dwelt there. If she had missed an opportunity of making some of her accustomed prayers or genuflections, she would say to her little companions, Come let us lie down on the floor and measure which of us is the tallest. And then she would stretch herself beside each of the little girls in turn, and take this opportunity to humble herself before God and recite a Hail Mary. After she had become a wife and a mother, she loved to tell of these innocent little artifices of her childhood. Her young companions looked up to her with a loving awe, and declared that the child Jesus used often to come play with her and salute her tenderly. The boundless charity, which was afterwards her characteristic, shewed itself very early in her life. She distributed all the money which was given to her among the poor, and wandered about the kitchens and offices of the castle, collecting scraps for them, greatly to the displeasure of the servants. She practiced great reserve in her words, and on festivals always laid aside some portion of her rich attire in order to honor her lord by this trifling humiliation. She daily sought to break her will in little things, and thus prepared herself to offer the great sacrifices which she was hereafter to offer him. She loved dancing, which was the favorite amusement of the countries, both of her birth and of her adoption, but would stop at the end of one turn, saying, One turn is enough for the world, I will give up the rest for the love of Jesus Christ. Elizabeth had scarcely attained her ninth year when a new grief befell her in the death of the landgrave Herman, the brave and pious father of her betrothed. In his lifetime, no one had dared to molest the child he so dearly loved, but now, although the young Louis was sovereign of Thuringia, he was in a great measure under the direction of his mother, the landgravine Sophia, who regarded what she accounted Elizabeth's excessive devotion with great disapprobation. The beautiful princess Agnes, who was brought up with her future sister-in-law, but who had acquired none of her spirit of detachment from the world and its vanities, bitterly reproached her with leading a life so unbefitting her rank, and told her in plain terms that she was fitter for a housemaid than for her brother's wife. The young ladies of the court soon adopted the tone of the two princesses, and even knights and gentlemen behaved to the friendless child with very unchivalrous discourtesy. It was agreed on all hands that she had nothing of the princess about her. On her side, Elizabeth shrank more and more from the society of the noble maidens around her, and sought her companions among the poor, but no tinge of bitterness or even impatience shewed itself in her gentle spirit. The injustice of men had no other effect than to throw her more entirely upon God. Like a lily among thorns, says one of her historians, she budded and bloomed amid troubles, and shed around her the sweet and fragrant perfume of patience and humility. It was about this time that an incident occurred, which has been related by all her historians. On the Feast of the Assumption, the Landgravine Sophia said to Agnes and Elizabeth, Let us go to Eisenach, to the Church of Our Lady, to hear the Grand Mass of the Teutonic Knights, by whom she is so specially honored. Perhaps we shall hear a sermon in her praise. Put on your richest robes and your crowns of gold. The two young princesses, having arrayed themselves as they were commanded, went down into the city, and on their entrance to the church, knelt upon fouled stools prepared for them before a large crucifix. At the sight of her dying savior, Elizabeth took off her crown, and placing it upon her seat, prostrated herself upon the ground with no other ornament upon her head but her flowing hair. When the landgravine saw her, she said sharply, "'What is this for, my lady Elizabeth? What new fancy is this? Do you want to make everybody laugh at us?' Young ladies ought to hold themselves upright and not throw themselves upon the ground like mad women or old nuns, who bow themselves down like broken reeds. Can you not do as we do, instead of behaving like an ill-brought-up child? Is your crown too heavy that you lie there all bent together like a peasant girl? Elizabeth rose and replied humbly, Dear lady, be not angry. See there before my eyes, my God and King, that sweet and merciful Jesus, who is crowned with sharp thorns. And shall I, vile creature that I am, come before him crowned with gold and pearls and jewels? My crown would be a mockery of his. Then she began to weep bitterly, for the love of Jesus had already wounded her tender heart, and continued praying so fervently that a fold of her mantle, with which she had covered her eyes, was all wet with her tears. The two other princesses were obliged for shame to follow her example, and to cover their faces also, which, adds the old chronicler, they would have been well pleased not to have done. As Elizabeth grew older, the persecution against her became more and more envenomed. The chief vassals and grave counselors of the landgrave joined in the outcry of the courtiers and ladies, and openly declared that she ought to be sent back to her father, for that a beguine like her was not fit to be the wife of their prince. The landgravine Sophia did all she could to get her shut up in a convent. Agnes repeated to her continually, My lady Elizabeth, if you fancy that the landgrave, my brother, will marry you unless you become something very different from what you are, you are much mistaken. But the prayers and tears of the dear St. Elizabeth were not poured forth in vain. Though far from her earthly father, her father in heaven watched over her continually, and contrary to the expectation of her enemies, the young landgrave never swerved from his faithful affection to his betrothed. He loved her the better for the virtues which drew upon her the contempt and hatred of the court, 
and took every opportunity permitted by the watchful jealousy of his mother to visit and comfort her. He never left home without bringing her some little present, a crucifix, a coral rosary, a holy picture, a jewel, a chain of gold, something in short which she had not had before. She would run joyously to meet him on his return and receive his gifts as precious proof that he had remembered her in his absence. Once, however, when he had been hunting with some foreign nobles who did not leave him till his return, Louis neglected to bring the accustomed present. The omission was triumphantly noticed by the enemies of Elizabeth as a sign of change in the feeling of her betrothed. The lonely and persecuted girl keenly felt the neglect and complained of it to her old friend and protector, Walter of Varilla, who had brought her from Hungary. He promised to speak of it to his lord. An opportunity of doing so soon occurred, for he was summoned to accompany Louis on a hunting excursion. As they were resting themselves together on the grass, within sight of Inselberg, the highest mountain in Thuringia, Lord Walter said to the young Landgrave, "'Will you be pleased, my lord, to answer a question I am about to ask you?' "'Assuredly,' said the prince. "'Then,' said the knight, "'what do you propose doing with the Lady Elizabeth whom I brought to you? Will you take her for your wife, or will you break your plighted troth and send her back to her father?' Louis sprang to his feet, and stretching forth his hands toward Inselberg, he said, "'Dost thou see that mountain before us?' Were it all of purest gold from its base to its summit, and all were offered to me to send away my Elizabeth, I would never do it. Let them say or think what they will. I say this, that I love her and love nothing better in this world. I will have my Elizabeth. She is dearer to me for her virtue and piety than all the kingdoms and riches of the earth. I beg of you, my lord, said Walter, to permit me to repeat these words to her. Do so, said Louis, and tell her also that I will never give ear to those who counsel me against her, and give her this as a pledge of my faith. So saying, he put into his hands a little double-cased mirror set in silver, wherein was a picture of our crucified Lord. The knight hastened with the mirror to Elizabeth, who smiled with great joy, and thanked him for having thus acted towards her as a father and friend. Then opening the mirror, she fervently kissed the picture of our Lord and pressed it to her heart. Louis soon redeemed his word as a knight and prince, and his marriage with Elizabeth was celebrated with great pomp at the castle of Vardberg in 1220. Louis was but twenty, Elizabeth only thirteen. They loved each other, we are told, in God with an inconceivable affection, and therefore did the holy angels dwell continually with them.